All right, we're going to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dorothy Lesichkova, and I'm a senior regional planner at SCAG. Um, thank you for joining us in the uh, SCAG's Traffic Safety Peer Exchange Series. Today's uh, Peer Exchange Series is on community engagement. I'll be facilitating today's session along with Tracy McMillan, uh, principal, uh, associate principal with Nelson Nygaard, who's one of our consultants supporting this project. And um, we're, if, if you haven't already, uh, please type your name and affiliation to the chat feature, which will help us know who's in the room. Um, so next slide. We're gonna go through some meeting logistics. The webinar length is about one and a half hours. Um, please take care to mute your audio and phones if you haven't already. At the end of the presentations, there'll be um, a uh, Q&A as well as a uh, report back from the breakout sessions. And if you, at any time you have a question during the presentation, you can type it into the chat box or raise your hand and we'll call on you after the presentations are finished. Uh, we'll also have a really great uh, Jamboard feature, which I will go over. Uh, which is kind of like an interactive whiteboard that people can optionally use. So if it's something that you're interested in, you can use it. And if not, uh, no worries. If you think of something later, you can email uh, agire at skag.ca.gov or the presenter. And all presentations will be emailed to those who registered to participate in today's webinar. Um, so today's peer exchange will include presentations focused on more meaningful community engagement principles, processes, uh, processes and programs in traffic safety from multiple uh, perspectives. Um, at the end of the presentations, we'll also have breakout sessions where you can chat more directly with today's speakers as well as, you, as, well as each other. Um, so we'll go over some of the breakout sessions, um, how that works, as well as the jam board um, after, um, after we go through the uh, Actually, in fact, I'll have to go through the, um, I'll go through the Jamboard uh, after I go through Go Human about Go Human. So we'll go over some of that um, right afterwards. So the presentations, I'll start with um, talking about Go Human and the overall traffic safety regional conditions. Then the uh, first presentation will be uh, from Monique Lopez, founder of Pueblo Planning on no trips, tips or tricks, meaningful community engagement demands more. Uh, the second speaker will be John Yee, um, the executive director at LA Walks, meeting communities where they're at, investing in community outreach through safe street promotora, uh, promoter educators. And then uh, we'll have two more speakers, uh, Ata Khan, planning manager of the city of Pomona, speaking about public engagement in the city of Pomona, lessons and opportunities. And lastly, we'll have community directed engagement in active transportation safety from Jill Cooper, uh, director of Safe Track. Next slide. So I'll just run through. I think some of you who have been to some of these uh, sessions already have seen this. So I'll try to run through this somewhat quickly and point out the key highlights for regional conditions and Go Human campaign. Next slide. So um, we wanted to overall the. Uh, discuss the overall trends in traffic safety and numbers of crashes and incidents with people um, dying or having uh, serious injuries uh, through the years. And there has been an, an upward uh, trend in total number of fatalities. Um, 1,450 people die every year from collisions in the Skag region and that 5,500 people sustain serious injuries every year from collisions. Next slide. Where are these collisions occurring? Um, uh, this kind of shows you where they're occurring, um, mo mostly occurring on local roads and uh, in urban areas and also in uh, disadvantaged um, and uh, disinvested communities as well. Next slide. Um, why are they occurring? Why are collisions occurring? Unsafe speed is the ma main contributing factor uh, in terms of how, how fa fatal or how injurious uh, the collision uh, can be. Next slide. So what is GoHuman? GoHuman was formed uh, in 2014 to address 
uh, these uh, trends in traffic safety across the SCAG region. It includes, it's the SCAG's active transportation safety and encouragement campaign, it includes co-branding and regional advertising, temporary day safety demonstrations and safety workshops and technical assistance. Next slide. These are examples of co-branded safety materials, which include lawn signs and bus shelters. Next slide. Go Human Kit of Hearts are the temporary de uh, demonstration projects, which includes bike lanes, artistic crosswalks, et cetera. Next. The Community Streets Mini Grants is an example of the technical assistance Go Human provides, which are mini grants up to $10,000 to community organizations. And in 2020, SCAG provided over $210,000 to 28 community-driven projects. And announcements will come uh, soon uh, to announce the, the 2021 recipients. Next slide. Uh, last but not least, there's the GoHuman Community Ambassadors Program, which is a participatory and experiential planning leadership series. Uh, the pilot counties are Imperial, San Bernardino, and Ventura. And we are, um, workshops and trainings are in progress. Next slide. And we highly encourage you, thank you for coming today, and we highly encourage you to attend the next set of, uh, of traffic safety peer exchanges. You can go on the website, gohumansocal.org to see the lineup, which are coming. There's more in, uh, in July and August. So we're really looking forward to seeing you as we wrap up some of the topical, uh, the topical uh, sessions to be more focused on regional, uh, regional cohorts. Next slide. That's it. More. That's it. <laughs> okay, great. All right. So then we're going to do a uh, poll at the end of the presentation to kind of get a sense of um, your uh, community engagement. So have your processes of partnering with community changed in the past five years? It looks like an overwhelming amount, 88%. Your processes of uh, Partnering with community have changed in the last uh, five years, 88% versus no, 12%. Thanks so much. Okay. Oh, I forgot. I should talk about the Jamboard. Thank Tracy. you so much, Dorothy. Uh, I am going to take over. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, I forgot about the Jamboard. <laughs> so um, before Tracy introduces our speakers, um, wanted to drop into the chat, um, the Jamboard, um, and I'll share on my screen what this looks like, uh, so you're not confused. So basically, if you can click, if you're able to click this, uh, the link, you'll be able to see there's four different slides on these, this, these Jamboards. And basically the, the purpose of this Jamboard is as you hear each speaker, you can type phrases or thoughts or images that connect with you so that when we go into our breakout sessions, um, you maybe feel like you have been actively engaged throughout the process. Um, on the left, uh, there's a toolbar where you can basically um, create a sticky note and then type up uh, you know, your thoughts, you can make the sticky note different colors, you can also add images, uh, you know, from a Google image search or upload an image that you might have. Um, too many windows open, I need to close this. Well, anyway, so you get the idea. And um, so this is completely optional. Uh, you don't have to use this function at all. There's one slide for each speaker. So if you advance the slides at the top, um, let's see, we gotta close this. But anyway, if you advance the slides at the top, you'll see that there's one slide for each uh, speaker and you'll be able to participate that way. So again, completely optional. Um, we'll see how this works. And now I'll pass the baton to Tracy. Great, thank you so much, Dorothy. And now we're gonna jump into the speaker presentations. Our first speaker, is going to be Monique Lopez, the founder of Pueblo Planning. And Edward, are we going to, can we put up, um, yes, Monique's presentation. Great, thank you. Uh, Monique Lopez is a social justice 
planner and founder of Pueblo Planning, an anti-racist values-driven participatory planning and design firm that intentionally engages and includes communities that are often left out of the planning process and those most vulnerable to the impacts of planning decisions. For the past 15 years, Monique has worked on transportation justice, environmental justice, and public space access projects, plans, policies, and designs. Specifically, Monique has worked in partnership with communities to co-create meaningful change by defeating polluting industries, stopping freeway expansion, and co-developing with the community sustainable alternatives, developing popular education materials to advance justice-centered movement demands, and challenging and changing planning methodology and practice to center the stories and solutions of BPOC and other communities that experience marginalization. Monique also brings this justice-centered approach and practice into the classroom as a lecturer at Antioch University, Pitzer College, and Cal Poly Pomona. So without further ado, Monique, please take it away. Thank you so much, Tracy, and thank you, Dorothy, and special thanks to SCAG for, for having me here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, and. You know, I just want to start off with some some grounding. Um, I use all the pronouns um, are fine with me. Um, and we, um, Pueblo Planning is actually um, based um, in Kumeyaay territory, which is the coast um, of San Diego that goes all the way down into Imperial County. But we do work on Tongva uh, territory, also known as Los Angeles and Mahashiman and in Orange County and, and San Bernardino area as well. Um, and our work really is rooted in this simple principle is that the voices of community members should be respected as experts and they, they should really be dictating their, the, their community, um, both present and future. Um, and with that as well, um, we see our role as planners, not as experts, because we see the community as experts, but we see our role as planner, as facilitators in these spaces. Next slide, please. So when I'm asked to give these types of presentations, I'm often asked in these spaces, could you share some tips and tricks um, on how to do community engagement? And that always uh, makes me um, uh, kind of weary because to do this work and to do it meaningfully and to do it well, um, there aren't tips or tricks. There's very basic things that any human requires in any space that they are in. Next slide. So we'll go over these four elements that we um, incorporate in our practice. Um, the first is around relationships. We ground our relationships in trust and we often do that by partnering with community-based organizations or grassroots groups that have those existing and long-term relationships with community members. Um, and it's also based upon, uh, upon this um, building these trusting relationships with, with community members directly. And as we do that, we also make sure that they know who our client is and we directly connect them with our client as well. So that even if we're no longer part of the process and project, they have a connection directly with the entity that will be carrying out the implementation of a particular project so that they could remain connected. And that's something that we share both with, with community members, but also with our clients in terms of the expectation of the relationships they are going to maintain and hold long after um, ourselves as consultants um, are, are completed with a particular project as well. Next slide. A lot of times uh, planning practice is rooted in this practice around extraction, going into a community and extracting information from them and putting it into a plan or being even worse, selecting, being selective of what community is sharing in order to um, reflect a particular narrative that maybe a planner may have or, or a particular leadership within a municipality may have. We seek to not do that. We seek to operate in repair meaning that when we engage in spaces, we're going in with a trauma-informed approach because many times folks are sharing um, experiences that could have been traumatic for them. When we're asking them, you know, what's your experience taking public transit? They may share an experience that may not have been a good experience. Um, so we always lead with a trauma-informed approach. Um, and we always try to facilitate processes 
in a manner in which can lead to community healing and community validation. So in this particular example, um, on a project that we did with Metro um, on understanding how women travel, we provided an opportunity for women to, um, and folks who identified as women to um, take some time to think about what their experience is um, taking transit. Um, we did some art making with that time. Um, and then people went around and they shared their story and their experiences. And as one person shared, another would share, hey, that happened to me. Or another person would share, that happened to me and this is how I dealt with it. And even though folks may have been talking about some um, uh, heavy things that may have they may have experienced, um, at the end of the conversation, um, people were, were leaving um, um, feeling lighter and really feeling validated in what they were sharing. Um, and next slide, please. And this is gonna go along with repair is around respect. Um, we really hold the utmost respect for both our community partners and community members as well. Um, and how we do that is we take data sovereignty. Um, data so sovereignty is really important to us. So the stories in which community members share, we make sure that as we document those stories and um, learn from them and how we can implement those into um, planning programs, policies, or designs, we always go back to the community and, and ask them, did we get this right? And we have the community and our community partners check our work before we then um, move forward with whatever is being implemented into a particular plan. But also re with respect as well, comes in the importance of um, language justice and disability justice and making sure that um, we meet people where they're at um, uh, linguistically, um, physically, um, and wherever people even may be at um, in, in their community um, um, as, as a body as well. Um, and so we incorporate that um, into both um, our budget and timeline is how are we accounting for for um, data sovereignty in terms of people having autonomy and, and sovereignty over their own lived experiences and building that into the timeline where people can check that work, but also into the budget, into how are we accommodating people in terms of um, their different capabilities um, and, and so forth. And then lastly is around reciprocity. Go to the next slide here. Really the practice of reciprocity is really um, around exchanging with others um, something for mutual benefit. Again, like I mentioned before, a lot of planning practice um, um, really centers extraction. We really wanna know like how is what we're doing um, um, in, in, in the community's experience also leading to their not only long-term mutual benefit, right? Which a lot of these planning processes, if they are implemented and move forward, they're five, 10, 20 years sometimes on the horizon in terms of a, a benefit for community. But how are we implementing mutual immediate benefit for the participants um, in, in a particular space? We do this in several ways. One, um, uh, we, we believe again, that community members are experts and as experts should be compensated for their time and for their, their knowledge as well. So in addition to um, compensation with our community-based partners, we also compensate community members for, for sharing their time and expertise. Um, but reciprocity goes much deeper than that as well, is looking for what are ways in the process in which we can use our positionality um, to, to be of benefit to the community. And so, for example, if someone shares with us um, and we're engaged in a planning process and someone shares with us an experience of, of, of being food insecure, right? We don't just go and make a note of it and say, thank you. Um, we're gonna put that in our report. We, we ask them, you know, um, would you be interested in, in being connected with an organization or being connected with a phone number or, um, or, or knowing who you can connect with in order to have that particular immediate need met? So we, we in a way also, hear people um, and, and respond in, in a way that maybe perhaps a social worker would respond in that situation. But I'll give you one last example here as my time is, is drawing near. 
Um, one way that we practice reciprocity most recently is we were engaged in a planning process um, in which we were reconnecting with residents that, that had participated in this planning process to share with them how what they specifically shared was being, being um, incorporated into a particular plan. And, may, and getting their informed consent all the way through the process. But since we had them on the phone, and this was about early on when vaccinations were starting to roll out, so this was in um, January, Febu February, um, we asked people if they had any questions about um, who was eligible to be vaccinated and, um, um, and if they were having any challenges, if they were eligible in, in um, getting an appointment. So early on, it was much more difficult. Um, and so as folks, um, as we asked folks that question, we had the county website up where we could immediately direct people to a particular phone number or a particular um, public health worker who could then make sure that they had access to, to being vaccinated if, if that's what they chose. Um, and also being able to answer questions early on where there was maybe a lot of confusion in terms of who was eligible, who was not, when folks would be eligible and so forth. And so that wasn't part of our scope of work for our project. We were doing an economic development, uh, community-based economic development project, but we saw that there is an opportunity to use our positionality in terms of being able to have access to some the internet and some information, right, that, that, and that others may not have had um, immediate access to and taking that extra time and care is building reciprocity into into the practice. Next slide, please. And with with all of that, when when we're talking about respect, reciprocity, um, repair, and um, relationships, these are things that um, anyone and each of you would like to be treated in any type of either planning or non-planning process. But I, but I do want to end with this note, though. These aren't tips or tricks, but these are things that need to be resourced. And that is incredibly important. And, and these are things that need to be built into both timelines and budgets, because this level of care um, requires, um, requires more time and um, of, 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 of your staff and also um, more time of your consultants as well and more time of the community. But what you'll see in the long run is people being willing and, and wanting to continue to be engaged in their community um, and also um, people building um, trust with, with public agencies and even consultants in the process as well. So thank you all. Um, here's my information. Um, would love to connect with folks. Monique, thank you so much for that great presentation. Uh, in the interest of time and wanting to get to the breakout sessions, we're going to hold questions for the and then hopefully we'll we'll have time to come back and and ask the speakers um, thoughts. So we do have one poll question after each speaker's presentation. Edward, can we see the poll question for Monique's? presentation. Great. So the question is, do you have a current or future project in mind that is using or can commit to using the four R's that Monique presented of equitable community engagement principles? We'll take a few moments uh, to let people record their answer. Okay, just a few more seconds before we close out this poll. If anyone else wants to vote, or you can re record your answer in the chat if you're unable to participate in the poll online. Okay, great. So we have about 78% uh, of participants on the call today that are currently using the four R's or can commit to using them on a future project. That's really great to see. So we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Let me introduce John Yi, the Executive Director of LA Walks. John is the Executive Director of Los Angeles Walks. Prior to joining LA Walks in 2019, John was the Advocacy Director for the American Lung Association in California, where he worked on strong tobacco control and air quality policies. 
At the Lung Association, John also served as a lead organizer by training tobacco control coalitions throughout the state. He helped bring smoke-free ordinances to over a dozen different cities, fighting back against secondhand smoke and big tobacco's efforts to target low-income and communities of color. John also served as the Interim National Director for Parent Revolution, an education and social justice nonprofit. In this role, he led parent organizing campaigns in Texas, Oklahoma, Indiana, and Ohio. He received his master's degree at Georgetown University and his bachelor's degree at the University of Michigan. He is a brother of Pi Alpha Phi, speaks Korean and Russian, and loves to cook. With that, I will give the floor to John. Thank you, Tracy. Can start with the slide. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is John. I am with Los Angeles Walks. Next slide, please, Ed. Uh, real briefly about myself, I'm a resident of Koreatown. Um, as you can see, this is sort of a, a collage of my community. And the reason I wanted to share it with is a lot of the reasons why I do this work right now sort of stem from my experiences here. As some of you may or may not know, Koreatown is considered one of the more walkable communities, yet it has some of the most dangerous and fast speed um, throughways uh, in the neighborhood. And so as a community that I consider home as a place, I think it's also an important example of how far we behind VR in Los Angeles. I've actually been hit twice on a bike in Koreatown. My grandfather, who's no longer with us, he was actually nearly hit as well because um, the lack of green space and the places for seniors to hang out, he have to often walk to the local uh, McDonald's to hang out, hang out with his friends. And so again, you know, the work that I do um, for me touches me viscerally. So next slide, Ed. So uh, Los Angeles Walks, we believe that a walkable LA is a just LA. And the reason I wanna share this is, is because our work isn't just about infrastructure. Um, it's infrastructure tied with social, social equity and justice. And so uh, that's something that we believe to our core. And so uh, hopefully the slides that I come next and when I sort of show you how we do our work sort of exemplify this. Next slide. Just to set a baseline, I'm not gonna read all the facts here, uh, to show sort of where we are in Los Angeles. Every 36 hours, an Angelino is killed in a car crash. The leading cause of death for our, uh, for our elementary and middle school children are car crashes. And so here in Los Angeles, we have a lot to do when it comes to traffic safety and infrastructure. Next slide. So I wanted to share a little bit about uh, our theory of change. And I think this sort of, sort of helps serve <clears throat> uh, my presentation about sort of how we do our engagement on ourselves. So it's really simple in, uh, when, when you write it out. So the first step is, we win safe street infrastructure, very basic. So stuff like uh, curb ramps, stop signs, crosswalks, flat sidewalks, things that one would expect as a basic service a city government owes its citizens. We work with community members as they pursue this infrastructure. And so for those who may have tried to apply for some of these things, you may know how long and difficult this actually is. Uh, the story I always share is one speed hump on average takes over a year to secure. And if you don't speak English, if you don't have access to internet, if you don't have the social and political capital or the juice with your city council member, oftentimes it is impossible. Next slide. And so our second step in our theory of change is as we do these local uh, on the ground campaigns, literally block by block, we leverage those experiences of our communities to build a larger movement. And so what happens is a lot of our community members as they pursue these things, they realize how things are broken systemically, uh, how, politic how politics plays a role in this. Um, so how socioeconomic uh, dynamics play in this. And so through this experience, our community members then secure positions of power. So on the bottom right, you'll see the LA Pedestrian Advisory Committee. A number of our community members have gotten appointments to there. Some of our community members have, been, have participated in electoral politics, ran for neighborhood councils. And so for us, this second step is incredibly important. You can't just change the streets, but you have to build a larger movement to change the system that created those crappy streets to begin with. And so for us, this is a yin and the yang. You cannot have one without the other. So we'll go on to the next slide. So how do we do this when it comes to community engagement? And so I want to share with you a, a program that we started a few years ago called the Safe Street Promotora Educator Program. And so this is the idea that no longer do you need to have professional advocates in communities organizing. Instead, those funds and those resources should go directly to the community so they can organize and set, set tables for themselves. Because at the end of the day, uh, sort of as Monique shared, they have the relationships, the first R that she shared, right? They have those already pre-built trust and relationships. And I think that is what we should be leaning into and not bringing in you know, a survey or from the outside, someone from the department or even a professional staff like myself. We should trust our community members to know what's best. And so the reason we call it Promatora is we pretty much mimicked off the public health model. As many of you know, Promatoras in the public health model, uh, they provide city resources, they help communities navigate systems. And so in the same way, 
our promotoras, uh, Nancy and Gabby, support their peers as they navigate city systems to secure safe street infrastructure. And so actually through the grant that uh, Dorothy mentioned earlier in the beginning, um, we were able to actually fund some of these projects. And so it includes training on GIS uh, and Google map making so they can create an argument for why their streets deserve safe streets. Uh, leveraging tools like WhatsApp, Zoom, you know, bridging the technology divide is something that we also invested the resources in. Another thing I want to talk, I'm really glad Monique was before me because I want to reference her R's. The fourth R that she mentioned, reciprocity, right? Payment. And so something that we make sure we do is we pay our promotoras at a competitive rate. We pay them at, at the same rate we pay our staffs when we apply for contracts and grants. And so for that, for us, we consider them as consultants. They are contractors, they're professionals. And so um, I think that's an incredibly important component. They are not volunteers. Next slide, please. And so I wanna show you some recent wins we've done from this model. So through our promotor work, again, step one, going back to our theory of change, we won safe street infrastructure. So on a fig and L is a major intersection in the community of Wilmington that connects the community with LA Harbor College and a lot of pedestrians and people who walk and roll and bike go through a certain, go through this intersection. And so they've actually managed to leverage not only LA Metro, but LA DOT and their local city council member and have them coordinate to fund about $50,000 worth of, pro, of the $15, sorry, the $15,000 price tag for this uh, crosswalk, this decorative crosswalk. So again, uh, for us, that's an example of promotoras who know the community, know what they need, and they leverage their own power for their local officials. Not us, not staff, but the community members. Another example I wanted to share is a, a sheltered uh, bus, st bus stop that was installed in Hawaiian and D, again, uh, in Wilmington. And so they, again, they leverage their power uh, leverage their connections and their relationships to get this installed there. Next step. Which then takes me to step two, if, if you all recall, right? Not only are we just changing local infrastructure down in the community block by block, but we're leveraging that to change systems. And so here actually you'll see that CD15, I'm sorry, let me rewind. This is the agenda for the LA Pedestrian Advisory Committee. It meets about every other month. Um, they're appointed by city council members. And so CD15 is actually one of the most well-represented city council districts because of Aparomatoras and sort of the leverage that they've been able to bring in with their relationships and their community. Next slide. Actually, can you go so one slide before, sorry. I forgot to mention this. So another thing that I also wanna throw in here, I, I realize I forgot to put the slide in here is, which is the word capacity building. And oftentimes when we talk about community engagement, people often throw out the word, we need to build capacity, we need to build capacity, we need to build capacity. And I think oftentimes we say build capacity, but we never ask the question for whom or who has to build capacity. Because oftentimes when we say build capacity, what we usually mean to put it bluntly is, we need to make sure people know how to tweet. We need to make sure people know how to call into a city council meeting and be able to give testimony. We need to translate their testimonies into English so that people can read and understand them. And so oftentimes building capacity, essentially what people are saying is, we need to make sure communities of color and immigrant communities and monolingual speaking communities are able to access and communicate with people in power, which are oftentimes white men. And so though that is one way of organizing, I think oftentimes I like to reverse that question. Why do we not have to also build capacity within government, or within agencies? So an example I like to give is, you know, I'm Korean. And so in the Korean American community, there's a, uh, an app that's called Kakao Talk that's incredibly popular uh, amongst Korean Americans, especially first generation Korean Americans. And that's a tool that they use to organize, whether you're at church, whether you're with your friends, whether you want to chat about BTS. It's an incredibly powerful tool. But outside the Korean American community, it's not really widely used. So if you ask the question, what is capacity in this context, in the context of the Korean community, that's a great capacity. It's, an, it's a powerful tool. But when you look at it in the context of government and power, it's not fair then to point your finger at the Korean American community and say, you do not have the capacity when they already have the tools they use. So I often have to ask, we also have to build the government's capacity to engage communities. If that's being innovative and using tools that they traditionally do not use. And that means getting off of Twitter and into other spaces. And so I always like to push that question, whom are we building capacity for and why? And so if you go to the last slide. So I'll just end with this quote. Um, this is El Peatonito. He was one of our fellows and he actually is known pretty worldwide. He dresses up uh, in a sort of a luchador sort of fit outfit and he does a lot of street theater. He's from Mexico City. Uh, but he had this really great quote that I always add in all my presentations and I'll just read it, which is, the pedestrian is nobody in the city. He has been forgotten by authorities and by our own citizenry. The curious and paradoxical thing is that we are all pedestrians at some moment. As such, we have forgotten ourselves. So I'll end it with that. Thank you all.
John, thanks so much for that great presentation. I was just jotting down your notes about capacity and capacity building. They were quite poignant and um, timely. Uh, so we have a poll question uh, for the end of John's presentation. When entering a community, is it part of your best practice that someone from that community lead the initial engagement? This is talking about what, how you're working with communities at the current time. Great, we're gonna wrap up voting in just a moment, there we go. So it looks like just over half of participants that uh, took part in the poll said that it's part of their best practice right now that someone from the community lead the initial engagement. And part of the goal of these presentations is to hopefully, is to help you think uh, and to learn from the information that the, the speakers are presenting. And, and so maybe the next time you go, you're working with the community, that'll, that'll be something that pops into your mind. Okay, we're moving on to our next speaker. Ata Khan from uh, the city of Pomona, the planning manager. Ata is the planning manager of the planning division in the city of Pomona, where he oversees daily operations. He also leads various long range and special projects for development services, including the forthcoming citywide complete streets ordinance and Pomona zoning code rewrite. Over the last several months, he programs which were established to provide business and artist relief during COVID-19 through innovative temporary land use solutions. He received a master's in urban and regional planning from the University of California, Irvine, Zot Zot, and a bachelor of arts in environment, economics, and politics from Claremont McKenna College. He's a current lecturer in urban design at Cal Poly Pomona's Department of Urban and Regional Planning. Okay, ready? Presentations up. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, thanks, Dorothy, and thanks, Skag, for organizing um, a series of really wonderful uh, peer exchanges that um, we're all looking forward to. And uh, thanks to Monique and John for a really insightful presentation. I think it's an honor for me to be able to join you and really hear kind of leadership in the space of community engagement in our region. Um, and a lot of uh, note taking I've been doing on some of the approaches that I've, I've already heard from. I wanna spend the next eight minutes, um, next slide please, uh, to really just go over three things. Um, first, some assumptions that we work with over here in Pomona on community engagement, some assumptions that um, I'm bringing into my engagement um, and that I hope to refine with, um, you know, as the previous speakers have mentioned. Um, what we're learning here in Pomona from some of the engagement we've done in the past couple of years as a public agency, and then uh, current approaches and really trying to um, connect with what uh, the, the, the focus here today is, is traffic and safety, of course, and uh, thinking about um, our complete streets ordinance. Next slide. So for assumptions, so uh, there's a lot of different theories of planning. There's a lot of different theories of engagement. Um, for, for, for me, I think from, from an assumptive uh, standpoint, uh, really planning is the politics of space. I think that inherent in placemaking or whatever you wanna call it is really these, this notion that there's gonna be politicking um, for how that space gets used. So uh, oftentimes when you know, you're driving down the 10, you're driving west to downtown LA and you, you look over and see the skyscrapers going up there, um, really planning is a series of negotiated perceptions. So uh, that skyline in downtown LA is a negotiation of how people view their space. It's choices that public agencies have made collectively over 100, 200 years. Um, and it's how that city is declaring through the built environment how it prefers to grow and intends to grow. Um, and with that comes a whole host of questions, but the two key ones that I think come up quite frequently are who, who is negotiating? And those terms of whether it's facilitation or mediation or engagement um, is, is really critical to understand who's actually um, playing that role. Oftentimes we as planners and public agencies do play that role. And then how many perceptions are being considered? And that kind of sounds like an abstract question there, but when it comes to diversity or equity, inclusion and justice, things of those, uh, those key words that in common terms we hear, um, are we really considering um, all of the perceptions of the community and how they wanna grow and how they wanna build and how they wanna 
um, live in their community. And that's true for the city of Pomona as well. Next slide. So what we're learning, so I wanted to put uh, four things here um, in terms of, uh, we're a public agency. City of Pomona is a public agency. Um, I'm, I manage a planning division of about 10 planners under um, our Director of Development Services, Anita. And so we're a pretty nimble team. We're a city of about 22 square miles and 150,000 people. It's pretty much analogous to the city of Pasadena. Um, and so we, we've learned a couple of things over the last three years or so as we've been a tight unit and we've prevented some turnover and we've really kind of had a coherent, uh, a cohesive group here, right? So the first is the role. And I think this comes on the heels of the last two speakers is, you know, planners within a public agency, we are bound to systemic solutions. We work within a public agency. And um, one of the kind of real challenges we face sometimes that I personally face is, um, am, am I at cross purposes with other planning roles, whether you want to call it radical planning or whether you want to call it community based planning or whether you want to call it nonprofit um, CBO planning. Um, is my work at cross purposes? Am I creating barriers, um, or or is am I adding value and complementing the work that's already being done in the city that I that I work for? And it's a kind of a a, a, a tough question, um, but it's one that's really important for me to understand my role as a public agent, uh, public agency planner. Um, it's a and what I mean by that is there are roles within there that I can't play but that I have to respect and validate in the community when I see it and kind of meet those roles where they're at and kind of work together as a team. And so uh, that really leads to the next bit that we're learning here, which is structure. Um, what we've come to find is that planners within a public agency, we directly work with zoning codes, um, admin policies. We um, do so much legal analysis that I, I wonder why I didn't go to law school sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, I should have, you know, up my hourly or something. And so there's so much land use law and so much constitutionality that goes into our work on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a little bewildering, but it's, um, it's also an opportunity for us as public agency planners, when we think about engagement, uh, you almost have an obligation or a responsibility to um, properly and clearly communicate how that structure works and how resolutions and ordinances are drafted and who wields power in a room and how state government code works. And do you know that there's 29 California codes and kind of communicating that in a way that's helpful to the community to fulfill their own goals and aspirations for themselves. Um, if we make an opaque structure and if we don't really open the door to show how that structure works, I, I can't as a public agency planner expect any kind of systemic solutions other than what we might personally want to do and pass without robust engagement. So that, that's a kind of a critical one. The third is capacity. And I'm really glad that John mentioned this because he's absolutely right on the money here, which is um, we as a city, as a planning division, what is our ability to increase our capacity? Um, part of the reason why we've gone after about two and a half million dollars in grants over the last 12 months is that we needed to build our capacity to communicate and work with stakeholders in the community. And I can't do that. And my planners can't do that because we're also processing fence permits. And we're also processing conditional use permits. And so we don't have the capacity to do some of the wonderful work that LA Walks and Pueblo Planning is doing. And so as a, as a public agency, it's trying to understand, okay, how do we increase or, or really first recognize that we cannot provide lasting value as a city by ourselves. We have to work with other agencies and we have to open that door. If we don't do that, I think we're kind of just fooling ourselves a little bit into thinking that we could do all of that. So capacity building um, uh, uh, is definitely an interesting topic and one um, that, that can be turned on its head. Um, and then lastly is approach. So there's, there's a lot of different approaches to planning, whether um, you, you feel you need to be out in the community on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you feel like you need to work behind a computer and, and, and you know, look at policy. Um, I, I, for lack of a better way of putting it as a manager, I, and maybe it's just because I'm watching a lot of basketball these days, but I, some of the core principles of teamwork and individual performance and sound ethics and just the ability to be at a counter and provide excellent customer service. I, we just like to incrementally improve those day over day. I think those core tenants are so valuable. Ethics are so important that um, 
uh, and, and being able to communicate is so important. It's no surprise, and you'll find this honestly across any public agency in the state of California or across the country. Um, when you see resumes for planning interns, they have worked at you know, Ulta and Sephora, they have worked at Jersey Mike's, they have worked retail, they have worked in industries where the moment you interview them, you understand their ability to connect with people on a basic level and they're really good at communications. And that's kind of an undervalued trait that sometimes gets overlooked because it's only seen from an academic lens. So approach can really come down to some core individual uh, tenants on um, how we engage the community and how we uh, talk. and. I, I love the four R's. I think that was just a wonderful learning exercise for me. So I think that's something that we would love to incorporate. Um, so next, um, next slide, please. So as far as uh, current approaches, and I wanna go through this real quick, I, I know I'm probably low on time. Uh, we've done some stuff with um, uh, our current housing policy. We led a six week housing academy crash course, two hour sessions with 30 Pomona stakeholders, where we really wanted them to know we have RENA numbers, we're updating our SCAG uh, in our housing element. We want to empower you and to really help us understand what kind of housing policies we need to adopt as a city. Secondly, we embrace this moniker of Pro Housing Pomona. Um, the, the pro tip here I could share is that if you want grant funding, um, align your nomenclature with your regional agencies and your state agencies. So if the state HCD is saying pro housing designations are available, we're calling ourselves pro housing Pomona because we can get a million more dollars for the city of Pomona. And so that's just kind of the reality of the matter. And it's true with complete streets as well. And it's not meant to be kind of short shrift on it, but you really want to align with what's going on around you. Um, so we are aligning our housing element with that designation. And then lastly, we're looking at express ADUs and really serving folks at the counter. We're doing about 15 ADUs a month, um, probably more than any of our partners in any of the cities around us in the region. Um, we, we want to understand why people are building second homes. We want to make it easier to build second homes, um, do pre-approved plans, do bilingual plan checks, things of that nature. So those are some current approaches we're taking into taking the community along with us, embedding them and really understanding uh, their needs. So lastly, as the next slide here, um, I, I wanna talk about, and, and there's a lot of text here, but on the left here, you see there's five things. Um, and we're really talking about the first, which is multimodal transportation in the realm of complete streets. But when we look at the right of way, the right of way is 25% of the city of Pomona. And I really appreciate what John said because it goes beyond uh, just the first category, but the right of way this is really an exercise that we're about to engage in with Complete Streets, which is how does Pomona want to reshape a quarter of its land? That's how I see it. It's not about streets and road diets as much as it is, how do you fundamentally want to change the way you think about your built environment? Because we have these other four things to think about. We have climate change and resilience. We need to reduce our VMT. We need to reduce GHGs. Um, we want to think about land use and activation. The the, the, the really sensitive and important work of understanding street vending in the city of Pomona, which is beyond my pale. I mean, this is, these are things we need help with with stakeholders. Understanding the liability and indemnification and insurance requirements that go with that. Understanding the fact that we can pass all of the development impact fees that we want, but do we realistically have the capacity to create more parkland or should we reconceptualize our right of way as that parkland to think about um, you know, 25% of our landing potential for park space. Um, and then lastly, which is I think the most important and underrated aspect of this that I've come to find is legal nexus. And this really led us to our complete streets ordinance, which is so much of what we're seeing is policy making and it sits in the general plan kind of ATP policy realm, green plan stuff that we have passed, but it has no teeth, it has no nexus, it has no proportionality. Everything that we derive and that we do as planners um, it's white collar policing, quite frankly, it's Fifth Amendment police power. And so we don't have the ability to impose conditions for walkability or for complete streets or road diets if we're not studying our nexus and proportionality. And so a quarter of our budget is going to be spent on doing that so we can actually zone the streets to the center line and establish real standards for um, all of these five categories that you're seeing. So that in a, a nutshell is a little bit about what's going on in Pomona and um, the, the, the last point here I would make is number two and number three are the key elements that we're going to need help with. How do we partner 
with some of these institutions that really helped us secure grant funding, like Cal Poly, Pomona Valley Hospital, Pomona Unified, how do we partner with our CBOs like Day One and other organizations who have operated in this space for the last several years um, to really make it an effective uh, effort? So with that, um, uh, that's all I got. Thank you, Atta, so much. I'm going to jump in for uh, for Tracy, who's having some Wi-Fi issues. Um, so, um, Edward, would you, would you mind uh, putting up the poll question? And I will introduce uh, Jill Cooper. So do you work in or with a jurisdiction that has a staff member dedicated to public or community engagement? Okay, uh, about 70, 65% of, of, of so of folks. Okay, so in the interest of time, let's, let's move on. Edward, if you can pull up the, uh, the next presentation. And I will begin introducing Jill Cooper, the co-director for UC Berkeley Safe Trek. Um, She's the co-director of the Safe, Track, Safe Transportation Research and Education Center, which is facilitates multidisciplinary traffic safety and injury prevention programs and research. She is a principal investigator on numerous projects involving pedestrian and bicycle safety, community engagement, highway safety planning, and she received her MSW in social welfare from UC Berkeley. Thank you, uh, Jill. Great, thank you very much. Um, first slide, please. Great. So um, I'm really happy to be here today, uh, June 22nd. I'm sorry about that, that date. Um, before I start, I really wanna thank um, Dorothy, uh, Tracy, Skag, John, and um, this very esteemed panel. Um, I feel really humbled to be a part of this uh, and um, so glad I've heard uh, so many examples of really truly um, effective and equitable community engagement. So what I'll be talking about today is uh, community directed engagement that um, we participate in at UC Berkeley Safe Trek. The Safe Transportation Research and Education Center is a research center at UC Berkeley. We're jointly aligned with the Institute of Transportation Studies and the School of Public Health. And so we're a very multidisciplinary group. We have researchers with backgrounds in engineering, planning, public health, social welfare, computer science, and so on. Um, and we've been around for uh, 21 years. Our mission is to prevent injuries and fatalities from traffic crashes and to use the resources of the university to do so. So today I'd like to talk about uh, community directed engagement that is built on the premise of a, a sort of theoretical framework called community-based participatory research, which um, you've heard some about in some of the other presenter, in all of the other presenters, presentations today and then give a snapshot of it as it's related to one of our outreach programs. So in a nutshell, community-based participatory research refers to research uh, whereby communities are equal partners in the research process and their interests are attended to in the same way that the researchers' interests are attended to. Uh, you've heard that the university and, and governmental organizations may have the uh, reputation of going into communities, taking what they see fit and leaving um, once their needs are met. And so CBPR is a way to work that differently so that uh, the research questions or the interventions are, are, are developed um, together and the needs of the community are, um, are integral in that. With CBPR, Researchers or safety professionals uh, don't come in with a set agenda, therefore, about what is important to the community and why. The focus of the research or interventions are determined by the, by the participating community, and there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to that. In terms of relationships, participants from the community are seen as the experts in their community. You've heard that before. Um, and that their experiences in the case of transportation using the roadway are to be valued and addressed. Uh, this is one area where qualitative data sort of as an aside become important to capturing the day-to-day -day experiences of all modes of road users. 
Uh, addressing multiple determinants of health refers to not treating issues in isolation and understanding that there are root causes to health concerns. Uh, it can refer to the various social or does refer to the various social, health, and economic issues that affect a person's health status. And CBPR considers those underlying issues and structures. And then CBPR principles um, include addressing issues that the host community considers important. So that in the context of today's workshop uh, and in transportation related work, it means that traffic safety is not seen as distinct from other issues such as food security, housing, jobs, et cetera. Safe access, whether by foot, vehicle, transit, bicycle, or all of those things together um, to all those resources and needs is, is related. Next slide, please. So how have we at SafeTrack applied CBPR principles to our outreach? Uh, today, I'll discuss this in um, context of our community pedestrian and bicycle safety training program. Um, this program, I'll shorten it as um, community ped bike program, not as a CPBST to avoid <laughs> further acronym confusion. Um, this project is a, is a partnership with the nonprofit agency, California Walks. We've been operating this for the last 11 years um, and it's funded by the State Office of Traffic Safety as these peer exchanges are. We've done um, over hundred workshops around California and we focus solely on under-resourced, underserved communities. Basically, when we work with communities, we have, um, we go through a several month process where we work with a planning team from the community to host this workshop and then work on follow up. We don't wanna um, go in, do a training and leave as per um, sort of best practice and um, really in making sure this is something that is useful and reflective of community needs. Uh, while we do need to identify and work on act transportation because of our funding, we do, um, our goal is to work with communities so that uh, we can apply um, or we can, we can be as responsive as we can to, um, to what the communities say are important or what, what issues within active transportation the community identifies as important. So um, I'll summarize some aspects of our community ped bike program and then talk about how we apply um, CBPR principles to that. So our community, um, the purpose of our uh, community ped bike program is to work with community partners to build and create safer and more accessible streets for walking and bicycling. We do this through um, working with the community to develop community led action plans that aim to promote safe and accessible transportation, active transportation. We work to educate local residents and safety advocates on strategies so that um, they can advocate in a, in a continued fashion for safety and other issues as, as time goes on. We work to empower community members to advocate for improvements that they identify in their neighborhood, whether um, it's a particular infrastructure improvement or a, new engagement program or setting up promotoras. Uh, we work to strengthen collaborations between community members um, on one hand and local officials and agency staff on another hand uh, to help make walking and bicycling safer and um, more pleasant and accessible. So uh, community-based participatory research comes in when we work with these partner with partner agencies to apply these strategies to the issues that they're concerned about. So for example, communities might be interested in safety around schools or access to jobs or commercial areas, or they might wanna develop a work plan that supports local community organizing goals in which transportation safety is one element. So our um, community pit bike program uses those goals as the sort of the launching point, uh, the basis for discussion, for walk bike assessments, uh, and for community-led action plans. Next slide, please. 
just wanted to give you a sense of what we found in some of our evaluations that um, we have seen that um, there has been an increased ability of communities to identify walk, um, unsafe walking and bicycling conditions and um, the increased ability to plan and generate ideas for safety, uh, to identify new grants for infrastructure, for engagement projects. Uh, we have um, also seen that um, there have been new partnerships formed um, that, that last more than um, for, for this project. And then we um, would hope to be able to evaluate or to look at in the future that um, these partnerships last not just for the active tra transportation project at hand, but for any issue that comes up in the future um, for them um, and gives them the ability and the, 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 the history of successful, of successful advocacy for, for their own communities. Uh, so last slide. Just want to thank you very much, and um, I know that I am um, looking forward to the discussion. And um, please feel free to contact me with any questions. Thank you, Jill. Um, can we post the final poll question? I believe is the final question. And so we're going to go into breakout sessions. Um, there'll be ten-minute breakout sessions. And this final poll is: Have you participated and facilitated a community-driven process on transportation and traffic safety? Um, so I'm going to share my screen for a second, show you the breakout session questions as uh, the SCAG AV team is dividing us up. Again, we'll do ten minutes. We'll have facilitators in each session to um, uh, ask the questions, take notes, and then report out. And hopefully we'll have a few minutes on the back end to ask questions of the speakers. Um, and please type them into the, the chat or the Jamboard if you have specific questions. So let me share my screen um, as, as we're getting switched over to the breakout sessions. Um, okay, so See, can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay, so essentially the, the, the objective is to, or the purpose is to learn how to apply some of this information to your own project, your own communities. So, um, you know, if you learned a lot over the last hour and now we get to talk about how to uh, apply some of these lessons. Um, the three questions are, um, what community engagement efforts have been a part that you've been a part of have, have went well or not well? Um, how do you enter communities, engage with them in, with, with respect? Um, and finally, a question around capacity building. Um, how do you conduct ca capacity building for community engagement and participatory, participatory planning? So we've talked a lot about, uh, about this uh, this hour. So um, I will end there. And um, Edward, you want to put us all in breakout sessions? Again, we'll be back in 10 minutes for a quick report out and a final uh, Q&A. All right, are we all back? Yeah, well, let's see. I think so, yes. I extended our breakout okay. a little bit because it was so rich. Okay. <laughs> We're like, um, hey, how come I was supposed to leave, but then there's more, anyways. Great. Well, if we're all back, uh, I have up on the screen the questions that we were speaking about uh, or were the, were the prompts for the breakout session. Dorothy, since you were saying that your session was so rich, do you want to do a brief report back? Yeah, yeah. There's some great, great discussions. Um, wish we could speak for longer, of course. Um, I think we kind of in general, um, talked about how the four R's that Mozique presented is such a great framework for, for, you know, improving community engagement. Like if you, if you kind of start at the outset with the four R's in mind, then you may be able to reframe kind of what goes well and what doesn't well in a, in a different way. And then we also talked about how um, there are, you know, if you start actually with capacity building as the outset, you will be, get so much better outcomes. So if you start with a process in mind and begin with a capacity building framework in mind, then, um, then you're able to work uh, in partnership with communities in a much more authentic and meaningful way. And then we sort of ended um, 
with um, some great thoughts about how a lot of times, that kind of the capacity building for whom question, which is a lot of times with government, uh, we may have this traffic um, project or whatnot, and the community uh, may have some other questions about government in general, about their services, mental health, or, or things that are, um, we may not as, as government workers who are maybe trained in engineering or, or something that isn't mental health based may not be able to be equipped to deal with. So it's like thinking about like building up the capacity for government to be able to work with allied agencies and community uh, based groups to then come to a community activity or engagement with those that capacity to um, anticipate kind of maybe some of the requests and questions that the community may have. Um, so that was that was that. I hope I captured things in a way, a way that we, we all discussed. Tracy, I'll jump in and, and go next. Um, so our, our group, we, we spent most of our time talking about kind of what, what works and hasn't worked. Um, and there was some discussion around um, kind of coming in, lessons learned around first time doing this work around building trust, kind of coming into the process, thinking that the community understands the same assumptions and will be supportive of a project without building that trust ahead of time. Sure, they might sort of see the same statistics and agree that there's maybe a right decision, but but if you don't have that trust, um, um, it's it, it it's hard to kind of get to that consensus. Um, uh, one example I raise, I do a lot of long range planning is, is, is the challenge of getting people to, um, uh, to see those, those sort of long term benefits and, and how it impacts their, their daily life. So I really appreciate the speakers talking about the immediate benefit to the community of, of the project or of the work that you're doing. Um, there's an example of uh, finding the right champion. So a, a, a finding a teacher who happened to work in a community and, and incorporating some of these projects into their, their lesson planning. Um, you know, entering a community with respect really um, relies on, on that trust that I just mentioned, um, building that trust, uh, using vendors from the community if, if possible. If you're going to throw an event, hire the local caterers, hire the local groups. Um, it's all about being in the community and, and establishing that trust. Um, and questions around compensation uh, of, of community members or community-based organizations, um, you know, important to set those expectations so that there is a clear um, ask of for what, what you're asking for. You know, they might not be part of the project team, but they're, they're providing value. And so what are you asking of those community members and, and, and the, the stipend or the compensation that you're providing? Um, you know, finally, we didn't spend much time on the capacity building, but just the importance of sort of building that into a project. And if you're working with a nonprofit or, um, you know, it can be, there's, there's a lot of challenges around um, uh, building that in. And, um, uh, you, you know, it's important to kind of scope a lot of this into the pro project from, from the beginning. Um, I'll conclude there. Uh, Tracy, are you still with us? Hi, John. Uh, Tracy's audio is acting up, so I could report back. Um, so yeah, we uh, we were only able to get through one question. Um, there uh, was a lot of rich conversation on just talking about uh, how there are some there there are some challenges uh, with uh, often coming across situations where. Uh, sometimes people conflate the strongest voice in the room uh, with the most uh, representative uh, voice of the group. So uh, creating challenges for misrepresentation of feedback, and th that's a big problem or a big issue when working in the public and local government uh, sector. Uh, there's also uh, conversations as well on how this pandemic has taught us uh, and allowed us to explore non-traditional ways for community engagement. Um, so that's one of the outcomes of the pandemic. Um, so thinking about what other ways, what other strategies there are for gathering input and uh, learning from this past year, uh, being online, virtual, remote, and continuing to learn through this process was some of the high level uh, answers we got through um, the first question. Thank you, Michael. Um, Edward, are you able to 
Um, are you sharing screen or is that Tracy? That's uh, Tracy. Tracy, uh, let me see if I can take control if, if she's uh, offline. I'm, I'm here, John. Oh, okay. Um, you want to go to the... What? to the next slide and I'll do the couple wrap up. I think we're probably out of time in terms of the questions. If you have um, questions for the speakers, um, please throw them in the chat or, or feel free to contact us directly. We'll be sharing these, these slides afterwards. Um, do you wanna to go to the, the last three slides, Tracy? I still see the breakout session slide. On my, it hasn't advanced. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna take control. Okay, you take over. Okay. Okay. Um, so just a couple helpful links. Um, you probably have already been to the website to get registered. Um, you'll be receiving an email thanking you. Please take the survey. We'd love to hear what you liked about this session. What we can improve for next time. Uh, we're going to be posting the recordings. Um, the PowerPoints will be posted uh, very soon. The recordings will be posted uh, later on. Um, we do have some upcoming events, uh, one on Thursday and one next week. Um, again, wanted to highlight what Dorothy mentioned earlier. We're wrapping up the kind of topical region-wide um, events and going to be focusing on um, more typology, so urban, rural, suburban issues in specific areas within the SCAG region. So I encourage you to attend any and all of those, especially those that are in your community, uh, and encourage others to join those as well. Um, you can go to the website to, to find out more about those and, and register. Um, I just want to thank everyone, especially the speakers, for, for joining us today. Um, and um, yeah, thank you so much, and, and have a wonderful uh, rest of your afternoon. Thanks all. Take care.